um, but we all like to, like you to be aware of it. And and secondly, I hope you will um, ask questions, contribute to the discussion. So to do that, we ask you to use the Q and A function. Uh, you can find that on the bottom of your screen. Um, there's also a chat function, but we prefer the Q and A um, just for practical reasons. So with that, let me introduce the speaker today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Shule Yailgan as our speaker. She is an associate professor at NTNU at the Department of Information Security and Communication Technology, and she's been there since 2009. She received her PhD degree in computer science in 2002 and has worked more than 25 years in academia, including a period, I think, as, as head of the department. Her main fields are artificial intelligence, machine learning, digital crime, image processing, document classification, and biometrics. And today, the title of her talk is AI and Machine Learning Activities and Results in Healthcare Research. So without further ado, uh, Jule, over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the nice intro introduction, Trim. So hello, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to meet you here. As uh, Trim introduced, this will be a talk related to AI and machine learning that we have, uh, learning activities that we have in the department, the models we use, uh, the results we obtain. Uh, actually, we have a lot of activities going on. So this will be, in a way, a flavor of what we are doing there. Uh, and our goal with doing healthcare focused research, education and training is to build uh, knowledge and capacity uh, related to AI and machine learning algorithms, techniques, architectures. And then we would like to use this knowledge and capacity in good cooperation with healthcare providers. Uh, and we provide decision support models to them and also in uh, cooperation with sometimes health technology providers. Uh, my first talk, uh, first part of the talk is related to uh, capsule video endoscopy. Uh, this is a uh, work uh, carried out by uh, Dr. Ahmet Kedir uh, in cooperation with Einstein Hövde, Jövik Sükehüse, under my supervision and two other colleagues. Uh, here, uh, a capsule. You see in the video now. The answer is blowing in the wind. A capsule is a small pill like uh, device which is swallowed by the patient, and the gastrointestinal tract of the patient uh, is explored videos are taken and uh, uh, the size of the capsules vary from model to model uh, model to model <laughs> and the sizes are approximately 31 by 31 millimeters and uh, approximately 50,000 images are produced and it requires two hours to review the gastrointestinal tract and I have provided a shape of an image of the gust, uh, the pill there. Uh, it has a miniaturized camera. It has a LED light source, a radio transmitter and a battery. So the first uh, term, terminology that was used uh, was capsule video endoscopy for this kind of pills attached uh, camera at the end and sometimes there are two cameras uh, attached at two ends and this can go through the full gastrointestinal tract but then uh, for those part of the body which uh, which is colon uh, the large intestine then uh, there are also pills with cameras 
Uh, and uh, when I use, when I say capsule video endoscopy in this to talk, I also mean colon capsule endoscopy and colon uh, is our focus in our work. Uh, we have some motivation looking into colon capsule endoscopy. When we look at literature, uh, there is some uh, material, there is some papers, and there are various types of lesions in the gastrointestinal tract, like polyps, adenomas, advanced adenomas, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. And when we look at the classification uh, accuracy, uh, sensitivity, specificity, uh, then we see that uh, sometimes the uh, these metrics are good. The values for these metrics are good. For example, 89%, 95%. But sometimes when the size of the lesions grow, then the uh, values of the metrics drop. So um, this, and we have high confidence intervals. This shows us that there is still some more work to do in this area. And uh, when we started with the PhD work of Ahmed, we had uh, actually two concerns. One is to do image enhancement, and the other concern was to afterwards do the classification. So uh, I will show what it looks like uh, when this uh, pill is swallowed and goes down the uh, gastrointestinal tract. And uh, the related challenges from the perspective of actually the practitioners is that uh, when these pills are swallowed and traveling, then uh, the uh, videos should show the vessels. Uh, there would definitely be some reflections due to the lead light, so they should be removed. Uh, the tissues uh, where the vessels are, they should be visible and the color should not change. And if it changes, then it should be restored so that the physical, the physician practitioner who is dealing with these videos actually um, do not require a new training. Uh, there is another set of challenges uh, as, in, as may be seen in this video. So when the uh, capsule moves down the track, sometimes you may now observe there is very fast changes from one part of the uh, track to the other part. There are sharp changes. Uh, but then this removes the natural uh, look of the screening of the video. So we need to move the what we call pie effect. There can be sometimes flickering effects in the videos. And when we are working with these capsules, the battery uh, actually uh, can get low. So uh, when we are doing classification and image enhancement, we need to make sure that we are not processing all the frames that we can actually uh, save some battery. And uh, as far as the polyps or the lesions, uh, concerned. There are different types of polyps. Uh, they are sometimes flat, sessile polyps. They are, they can be pedunculated. Then there is a stalk. Uh, these polyps can be neoplastic, cancerous, or hyperplastic, and they vary a lot in appearance, orientation, and shape. And also uh, here, actually, on this part of the slide, you can see different types of polyps. And our focus is basically on detecting polyps in the colon. And uh, here, another example, this shows these different stages of ulcerative colitis development and how it looks like uh, in the patient's um, uh, body. Uh, again, when we started with this work, we did not have labeled data, but in time we solved this problem by using colonoscopy videos and uh, also meantime labeling existing data and some data sets also appeared meantime, uh, which are labeled. And colonoscopy actually is the gold standard for taking the uh, images from the colon and uh, that's a tough process. 
uh, it can be inconvenient for the patient. Uh, and for that reason, capsule colon uh, endoscopy or video capsule endoscopy is the chosen alternative. And there are areas of research we have defined. Uh, we did not focus on all of this. Uh, we worked uh, on different pieces, but there are issues related to image quality. So the state of art uh, for image enhancement, uh, and there can be also liquid in the colon uh, or in the stomach. Uh, so there is a need for image enhancement and what was the literature around this? Uh, is there any differences between image enhancement for natural uh, videos uh, and for particularly capsule windowscopy of, or co colon capsule endoscopy videos? How to evaluate the improvement in image quality if we are able to do so? Also, we work with videos and each uh, frame of the video is an image for us. Uh, sometimes we may need to increase the frame rate. How to do that? Uh, there could be, as we have seen in the in one of the videos, uh, some sharp movements from one frame to the other. So the contents of the frames could be quite different. Uh, then how do we actually compensate for this? Shall we add in between frames? How to do that? And uh, in the end, uh, we extract image features to do classification of these different types of polyps. But then how do we capture trustable uh, image features? And uh, also video summarization is to provide decision support to the practitioners such that we do not actually ask them to observe all the frames in the videos, let's say for two hours, but then uh, pick up some key frames that really we know have uh, content information in it. But then are there any available data sets? How do we measure the entire frame similarity? Uh, types, the shapes, orientations of polyps, I said they are quite uh, heterogeneous. Uh, how do we extract image features? What kind of image features should we extract from these different lesions to separate them in a discriminative way from each other? These were the uh, questions among, other, among others. And also the pathology detection classification part. So uh, we have both worked on uh, classical machine learning, but also deep learning. And in deep learning, there are some deep models that have been already uh, trained with using some existing data sets, not necessarily uh, capsule, uh, colon capsule or video capsule or colonoscopy data sets, but from other domains. And uh, there is also the possibility to train these uh, deep models using um, data uh, from scratch, uh, setting parameters, uh, calculating the weights and so on. So which one to do, shall we use them both and how to improve the performance because I have shown there is some already work done, but then uh, we need to do improvement. And uh, to begin with, there was really no data sets, but then there were smaller data sets appearing and deep learning models require large data sets and how do we deal with small data sets? These were the questions. So for the stochastic, for the image enhancement part, we have done some stochastic image enhancement. And then uh, we have actually used videos uh, from uh, taken by the peel cam from the company called Given Imaging and Microcam. And that is actually the data set, kit data set. I have provided the link here. And the idea was to use a stochastic enhancement method. And uh, consequently, uh, using that approach, we are able to enhance the images. So in stochastic image enhancement, actually, we have concentric circles. So we take a seat and inner, within the inner circle, we do some random walk. And then as we are doing the random walk, we are also uh, doing some smoothing and updating the uh, intensity values of the pixels. And uh, in our experiments, we have uh, used uh, gray level images. 
And the images can be, of course, uh, colored images and gray level images. Sometimes we are dependent on the uh, data set we are using uh, related to whether we use gray scale or color images. And sometimes uh, we on purpose use gray level images. But no matter for the uh, image enhancement part, then uh, we have done some subjective evaluation experiments with Jovic Suke Huse. Uh, I think there were five or six practitioners who have evaluated uh, our approach using the stochastic sampling uh, method versus the other approaches that one can find in uh, literature. And so uh, here we do not show, actually, and we did not when we uh, provided the experiment, tell, of course, the uh, practitioners which image, there are four alternatives here, which image comes from which algorithm. But in the end, using different matrix, we uh, also uh, were able to get uh, high, uh, good or, or good evaluation results of our work. So one uh, evaluation was here and we had a high score and another evaluation was done and the green um, dots show the evaluation results uh, of our approach and uh, it scored high. So here I can tell uh, which actually uh, when we have a, have a visual look image is which one? So this is the input image. This is the proposed image. There are these other VLS uh, gradient minimization, local extrema, bilateral, and so on algorithms. So if you look at carefully to these images, actually we were able to reduce the contrast and make those parts of the uh, uh, image that are not visible earlier visible to the practitioner. Uh, and in the other uh, algorithms, still, this is the areas that has been challenging for us, but uh, they stay almost the same. Uh, sometimes uh, the, for the other parts, uh, for the other algorithms, uh, in this part of the uh, images, you can see that uh, they perform well. But sometimes also there is this textural changes. Uh, if we look at the images carefully uh, in the other algorithms compared to the one we proposed. So uh, I, we believe that is the reason why the practitioners uh, scored uh, our proposed method highly. And in terms of uh, pathology detection, uh, that was the image enhancement, and this is the pathology detection. So of course, for image enhancement, there are uh, more uh, techniques than I have listed here, and that we have made uh, comparisons with. Uh, but as I said, this is a flavor of what we have been doing at the department. So uh, I'm only taking bits and pieces here. For the pathology detection, that is the pathology classification, whether we have a polyp or we don't have a polyp in the inspected colon area. So there are two approaches we have focused on. One is the handcrafted features approach, and that is uh, extracting some features manually from the images related to shape, appearance, texture, sift, and so on. Uh, in this uh, approach, there is always high positives and low, uh, false positives and low true positives. In the deep lab, uh, learning approach, on the other hand, we can uh, do two things. We can just take these RGB images and then uh, put them into uh, the deep model and then uh, either train from scratch or we do transfer learning and then get the classification result. But on the other hand, there is this hybrid approach. We can use convolutional neural networks together with the handcrafted features. Uh, and we have also focused on RGB channels for the color images. Uh, as you know, into convolutional networks, we can provide these two, three channels and uh, we will apply filters on each of these channels separately. And in the deeper layers, there will be some uh, features extracted plus the handcrafted features and then do the classification uh, afterwards. 
So we have really done uh, use different models, but one model I will focus on here is because we got good results here is what we called this Ynet model. Uh, it uses the advantage of transfer learning. Uh, it also uh, allows us to do training from scratch and it uh, addresses the performance loss uh, due to some mm, domain shift. That is from natural images to capsule colon endoscopy images. So how does the Ynet look like? So it is a set of encoders, which is connected to a decoder. And the idea here is to have the uh, image and these images are fit into the deep networks um, one after the other so that the classification uh, is done continuously. And the outcome of the decoding step is where this polyp is and also the pixels which contain the polyp. So uh, for this work, we actually used not uh, long capsule images, but we have uh, utilized uh, uh, colonoscopy images and videos for the explained reasons. And the model actually has this basic, basic uh, VGG19 network, which is a convolutional neural network. And two encoders we have employed. The first encoder is this copy, pre-trained uh, copy of the VGG network. And the second encoder is the trained from scratch model. And the decoder on the other hand uh, actually is formed uh, by copying and pasting some of these uh, layers from these two encoders into this model. And at the end, there is this convolutional la layer. Uh, and we have used RGB images, so the image area can be uh, actually provided out of these uh, steps. Uh, we have used this uh, data set, Asumayo Clinic. As I said, it is colonoscopy videos. And then uh, we had uh, 4,278 uh, frames or images with polyps out of 18,000 approximately uh, for the training set and 4,300 in the test set uh, out of 17 uh, images or frames. Uh, I want to give a background information related to actually the metrics we are using. So uh, precision and recall are two metrics we are using uh, in information uh, retrieval, uh, also widely used in uh, deciding whether our classification system use go does good or bad. Uh, so in a set of images, the whole collection, there will be a set of retrieved images and there will be some relevant images, but which are not retrieved. So we call these retrieved and relevant images as true positives, uh, not relevant, but retrieved false positives, not retrieved relevant as false negatives and not relevant, not retrieved as true negatives. And precision is defined as these true positives out of this uh, retrieved set. And recall is defined as true positives out of this relevant set. So when we are talking about recall, it means uh, there are uh, images I should have retrieved because they are really relevant, but I don't. And uh, as far as precision is concerned, there are images I retrieved, but uh, actually I shouldn't have retrieved them because they are uh, not uh, correct images. They do not have, for example, polyps in them. So everything, every other measure, F1 score, F2 score, accuracy, revolves around, around these metrics. Uh, for this Ynet, we have done an ablation study. So there is this uh, in literature unit. So it is two encoders which used for classification. And as far as precision and recall and F1, F2 measures are 
uh, concerned and I have uh, given here the formula for how to calculate the F measures. So the unit actually when we do experiments on the data set have some values uh, with these two branches unit only in the form of a pre-trained encoder uh, VGG19 gives some uh, results and why not. So uh, for the from the perspective of recall F1 and F2 our uh, approach actually outperforms. Uh, so uh, this was good and then we went to further uh, compare our results with other approaches not necessarily unit by the other teams and here uh, also uh, from the perspective of recall f1 and f2 uh, we were able to actually retrieve images retrieve in this sense means that if there is a polyp then there is a polyp in that uh, image if there is no polyp then there is no polyp so i wouldn't call an image without the polyp as an image uh, with polyp. Uh, so Ynet gave some good results and here is the uh, performance of Ynet. So in the middle video, you can see that uh, we can actually uh, decode where this polyp is. And uh, this blue mark shows the center of the polyp. Uh, so as the pill goes through the, uh, the colon, uh, we sometimes, of course, lose the uh, inside area of the colon, but uh, the, the, the performance is quite good. Um, so this is one video and I will cut it off here, but I have another video. Uh, and you can also see the this is the other video so you can see the performance of using these two encoders and one decoder so as long as there is the polyp then the system does not really uh, miss the polyp area much so if you would like to receive some more information related to this work, then uh, I have provided the links here and the QR code there. And we have also this work related to skin lesion classification. Uh, this is a cooperative with uh, another colleague of mine and a postdoc and a few master's students. Again, this is uh, some part of our work and we have a lot more going on. Uh, so. Here, melanoma is the focus, and it is the uh, deadly skin cancer. It's caused by intense radiations from sun, and uh, the skin lesions are broadly classified as melanoma and non-melanoma, and if actually they have under categories. So the image here shows the melanoma, and the next Im image here is non-cancerous, non-melanoma, and this is a particular type, which is seber cake keratosis. Uh, so uh, what are the challenges? Uh, doctors, of course, do manual inspection, but it can be difficult and time consuming. Uh, but there is the need of pre uh, precision. So if a lesion is non-cancerous, so it should not be identified as cancerous. So we are by no means uh, intending to replace any uh, practical practitioners knowledge and insight. As I said, this is just a support tool uh, we are developing and also to understand the AI and machine learning ar around this. So uh, what is the technique and methodology that we can use to improve the detection accuracy here? Because there is also uh, uh, work in literature and also sometimes the hairs on the skin, various uh, lesion shapes, uh, they cause a challenge. Uh, so we have applied the similar approach here and uh, in as a solution in one of our works, we have utilized deep learning plus handcrafted uh, features 
And there is this ISIC archive where we get these melanoma images from. So, of course, these uh, images uh, increase in time, the data set grows. At that time, we trained uh, our um, uh, models with 900 images and we had 379 test images. So we also have a small data set uh, we collected from our partners, but ISIC Challenge is more uh, complex and uh, complete data set for this. And these are the um, shapes of melanomas. So for handcrafted features, we have based on some work uh, our team has done, employed our SURF features. So uh, in this approach, uh, we check line by line the melanoma image, and then we pick up the local extremes. And uh, so per line, we pick up the local extremes. Uh, and we actually define four characteristic functions. So when we pick up these extremes and we plot them over the image, uh, line by line scanning, uh, max mean values, and then collect this information per line for full image. And then we go ahead to define our characteristics function. Uh, phi y is, for example, uh, the length of the slope uh, phi 2 is the height difference between the highest and the lower point of the slope. Uh, phi 3 is the sum of the intensity values that belong to the slope. And uh, phi 4 is this second derivative sign changes. And then out of this, uh, we get a feature length of uh, 2000 features. That was one uh, feature set. We also extracted features using local binary pattern approach. So the idea here is that focus on this nine pixel area, pick up the middle pixel, and then compare this middle pixel with the surrounding pixels. And if the compared pixel is smaller, then put a zero in place of the pixel. If it is bigger, like here, compare seven and five, then put a one in place of seven. So we get a feature vector there, and for example, here, the feature vector or the LBP pattern is, if you sum up these ones in binary format, will be 117.8. And then, so we can have this two to the power eight variations of feature sets, very good. And then combine them because we are doing this LBP operation per pixel in the image. So scan the full image, every pixel is middle and then do the comparison, get this binary value. If we do so, and if we do so by taking this radius to be one, two, three, then we will actually get 768 features. So out of that, in total, we have this 2,768 values, handcrafted values, and then put them into the traditional SVM classifier and estimate the class and calculate the score. So for uh, extracting the deep features at that time, uh, we have used an AlexNet deep model. And uh, of course, there is this layers of convolutions, ReLUs, uh, max pooling layers. But in the end, there is this, at the end of the architecture, there is the fully collected layers. So extract the deep features, put that into the FSM classifier, and then get a class estimation and a score. Uh, so uh, also some metrics, further metrics. So accuracy is defined as true positives plus true negatives over number of samples. Uh, this TPR, which is also called sensitivity or recall, true positives over true positives, false negatives. And there is this metric of specificity that is this time true negatives over true negatives, false positives. And then we use two types of curves. One is the uh, precision recall curve, and we are interested in the area under this. And another one is this rock curve, and we are again interested under the area the area of this. But uh, the sharper the rock curve is, so it has a high slope at the early uh, parts of the rock curve, uh, then it is better. The performance is of the classification is better. 
So we have compared uh, the two SVMs we have used. And the first SVM is um, uh, for only handcrafted features. And you can see this uh, average precision and other metrics. The second SVM is only one color chiller and using this deep features and then using an SVM to further do the classification using these deep features. So there is not much difference, but still we can here see that um, the deep network performs better, but we also need to keep in our mind that the second network uh, does classifications using RGB channels, but the first one uses only the gray color. So finally, our image classification model is input, handcrafted, SVM, D features, SVM, estimate the image class with a score, estimate the image class with a score, compare and make a final uh, decision. And we have actually compared our results uh, with one of the melanoma uh, classification challenge of the time. And that challenge is uh, made using this accuracy metric, and we were able to uh, have a, get an accuracy of 0 0.82, which is, uh, which is the fourth one. Okay, so uh, we also considered optimizing our D features to improve melanoma detection. And what does that mean? So get the input image, do some image processing or not. Uh, in our case, the image processing corresponds to uh, having a gray level image, extract the deep features, do some feature reduction on the deep features, and then do the classification. And then here is the AlexNet. And out of AlexNet, we were getting 4,096 uh, features. That's a quite large number. But then when we employed this LDA, so we have this melanoma images, we have the non-melanoma images, take the mean of melanoma, take the mean of non-melanoma, take the differences. Here we have a plot. So the differences are high than the uh, classification performance is better. For that reason, we were actually focusing on this area. So picking up those features. As you know, the training of this uh, deep networks take a lot of time. Now it can take hours, but earlier it was taking days. Uh, now we can do, use GPUs, we can use uh, multiple GPUs simultaneously. Uh, but it is important still to um, reduce the number of features, particularly because we are also working not only with the images always, but as you have seen in copsil, uh, endoscopy, uh, colon copsil endoscopy, there is videos and frames are one after the other. And we have made a comparison here. Uh, I'm also meantime checking the time. Uh, so we ha have tested this, the features, uh, dimensionality reduction, the classifier, and the classifiers are uh, the traditional classifiers. The models I have shown on the slides use SVM, but there is also possibility for using KNN, bias, discriminant analysis. And uh, in columns we give without dimensionality reduction, and on the two columns we give with dimensionality the reduction. Uh, and versus different classifiers. Uh, so actually the second column without LDA, second column highest, labeled highest, gives us the highest value for different um, experiments. And the last column gives us the highest value for the 200 features maximum. Uh, and we can uh, conclude here that the SVM classifiers actually mainly are good at classifying these features with dimensionality reduction and without dimensionality reduction. Uh, for some metrics uh, like specificity, there can be some uh, lower values, but on the average SVM, uh, sometimes Canon also performs well. Uh, so, we have 
moved ahead to make a comparison related to also uh, comparing different feature reduction methods. And those are PCAs and relief F, again, using different classifiers, again, making a comparison uh, using different metrics. Uh, and here you can also see that LDA really performs well. Sometimes relief F uh, and PCA uh, also uh, performs as well as LDA uh, approach. Uh, so uh, now I will move on to the uh, other uh, part of my talk, which is related to using uh, not machine learning, but still it is machine learning association rule mining to this time uh, identify irritable bowel syndrome. This was a work done by a, Toma by a master's student, Thomas. Uh, and here uh, we had a focus on uh, Norwegian population, so 10 to 20 percent of Norwegians have this uh, syndrome. It is painful, it can cause to diarrhea dia and other uh, side effects. It reduces quality of life. There are different reasons like stress, uh, less of activity and uh, keeping an improper diet. Uh, for that reason, uh, we had a focus on this. And our uh, solution actually, uh, or our focus more of was finding this relationship between which food items uh, cause which symptoms or which food items actually cause symptoms. So does an apple cause symptom? When does an apple cause a symptom or apple doesn't cause symptom, but something else I eat uh, cause some symptoms? What, what is it that causing problems in uh, my diet? So uh, we had used this association rule mining approach because as you know, this is inherently a problem of uh, unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning, uh, we have the data, but we don't know how to match this uh, input data to the output data. Uh, and for that reason, we were through association rule mining, hoping that we would find, find these pairs that match. And that also means discovering some hidden patterns, discovering handsome X causes Y rules. And we have developed a methodology and architecture here. Uh, we required people to register symptoms. They also registered foods and they can register symptoms and food uh, anytime. We uh, kept these logs on uh, databases. We have run this association rule mining algorithm. And then the results we also uh, wanted experts or cooperated with experts to interpret. So this is the screenshot of the shots of the mobile application. So you can actually given a scroll down menu, uh, say what you have eaten, and then you can also uh, give the corresponding uh, symptoms. So um, for the registration, we have actually originally recruited 90 people. Uh, some of these wanted more information. Meantime, the numbers dropped to 26. And then out of this, 14 agreed to participate in logging information. And in the end, actually, there were only six uh, people who were registering their uh, food intakes. And the period of time was two weeks. So uh, the registration timeline, uh, I said we scored, we stored these logs. So register uh, the intakes, register the symptoms and in time. And then we were also dividing the time period into two hour periods, but also we of course made uh, some experiments related to increasing this uh, time pre periods to four hours. Uh, and I think that also we used six hour time periods. So in associative rule mining, the main algorithm running is this I, a priori algorithm. Uh, run it on the data set, uh, find the frequent item sets, apply the 
uh, then obtain the uh, out of this a priority association rules uh, and with some confidence intervals. So yes, we have discovered some rules, like if somebody has eaten poultry and if it had been raw, then the person had symptoms. And here we are giving the confidence intervals. Cheese, which is extra fat, it had given some symptoms. And of course we had the list of symptoms as well. And then there were six domain experts, uh, which we received feedback from one doctor, one nurse, one neuroscientist, three clinical nutritionists. And when they look at these rules, then this was actually confirming their current knowledge. So this was a master student work. So of course he had some questions. Uh, I brought this table in, but then uh, what we see that, there are, of course, some food groups like carbohydrates, proteins, and so on. There's some relationship between them and the symptoms, but also per uh, item in this uh, intakes like carbohydrates, let's say bread, protein, milk, meat, uh, vegetables, this and that. So we were able to find also some uh, associations. And uh, then these associations, as I said, were in line with what the domain experts were, were uh, having as uh, their knowledge. So then our conclusion was that, yes, we can use association, association rule mining as a tool for uh, decision support to map symptoms to food intake. However, we need more data. We need to do more experiments. And then, so we had a limited set of triggers that the people can select from, but of course this set can be increased to a full set. So uh, I have gone quickly uh, also for this third part. There are a lot of details around this. How did we decide these food types? There is this uh, food list uh, pro uh, provided by uh, Health, World Health Organization and so on. I didn't touch that, but uh, in the end, we were able to make these associations. So uh, for the skin lesion part, I have given these references for the video capsule endoscopy. Uh, I have given this QR code. Uh, we unfortunately did not uh, publish this association rule mining um, work, but of course there is a master thesis related to that. And I think uh, that concludes my uh, talk and thanks for listening to me. So uh, I think we have enough time to take uh, questions, Trim. Thanks a lot, Trula. And, uh, and I'm very impressed that you were able to get to sort of cover all this content in, in 50 minutes. So uh, I'll still encourage people to ask questions. Uh, we've got we got a couple of questions, uh, so let's let's uh, start with one of these. I think the, the first question is is um, specific to the first part of your your talk. So it's a question from Yum, asking would it be feasible to build a huge database of capsule endoscopy images in animals and using that database for transfer learning when evaluating human colon images with deep learning. I think this is a good question. So the first thing is what kind of animals and how will you make this uh, animals uh, swallow the capsules? I think that is a challenge. So I haven't looked into this gastrointestinal tract uh, of the animals. Uh, when I say transfer learning, actually we are um, making experiments um, where the uh, transfer learning has been done on images from natural scenes like flowers, objects, people. Uh, and we use this gastrointestinal tract uh, images and then see how they perform uh, with the testing. So I cannot claim that really uh, this uh, accuracies are high, but still uh, we can uh, get reasonable accuracies. So I think if there is big similarities between this intestinal system of the animals and the humans, uh, then of course, maybe it is uh, better to uh, do transfer learning using their gastrointestinal trained images and the human uh, images are tested with. 
but I have no idea if the animals actually have polyps, if they have lesions, those types, uh, if they have the similar digestive, digestive problems and uh, what kind of animals, uh, is it a cat, dog, what is it? So that would be my answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. The second question, at least uh, it's, it's from Ta Wan Lee and I'm, I'm trying to interpret it. Um, I think I think the question is, given that you're working on health, you know, on on, on health related questions, um, what does that mean in terms of um, the the quality of the methods needed for these to be, you know, useful in a in a clinical setting, uh, and, and particularly given the sort of the stochastic nature of uh, of AI and and machine learning. Mm. Um, techniques. Yeah, I have stressed in my talk that uh, these are only decision support tools and they are to, uh, yeah, provide some decision support. No way to, uh, we never claim, although our accuracies in comparison to re uh, literature, they can be uh, sometimes really good. But um, in comparison to expert knowledge, how good are they? So we try to, uh, get that understanding by, you know, making questionnaires, uh, by making the experts to evaluate our results. So when they evaluate results, like comparing our results with others, they can comment on it. Yes. But um, still, the we have great respect for, of course, expert knowledge. And uh, I don't know if there is any medical uh, participants from medical area here. Um, I wouldn't want to comment too much on this question because I also want to support the work we are doing. Uh, but the, the, main, the main thing is the expert's decision. We are only a decision support. But is it 10%, 20%? Yes, our accuracy is high and reasonable. Uh, that that still needs to be seen. I would okay. say. Th thanks, thanks for that uh, answer. Mm. Uh, I have one more question here, going back to again the first part of your presentation. It's about the capsule, and it says it's by Philip Hulik. And the question is: Could an accelerometer placed in the capsule be used to detect the capsule movement and to trigger more frequent camera updates? Uh, actually, uh, these moves are measured. I'm not into these techniques too much, but uh, for example, there's there's a difference between video capsule endoscopy and colon capsule endoscopy, I said, uh, because these frame rates, uh, they are adjusted in the colon capsule endoscopy. Mm. So uh, if the... Uh, if the, if the capsule is in the stomach, it resides there and the number of frames is approximately four, four, four frames per second. When it comes to the colon, then this frame rate is increased. Uh, for that reason, colon capsule pill comes are different than video capsule pill comes. So I don't know the technology behind it, but there is difference in how many frames are taken uh, per different parts of the gastrointestinal tract. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe an accelerometer can be built in, but it could be some naive, you know, uh, answer to say yes, no, uh, but something we can look into. Yeah. Very good, thanks. I have a question on my own behalf. Uh, which is which is not directly linked to your your presentation, but I, I wanted to ask, sort of, given your background and given your affiliation with the Department of Information Security and Communication Technology, and plus this interest in in health applications, I'm I'm curious to what sort of degree does uh, topics such as privacy preserving methods, you know, in in this area of of health uh, data driven health methods. Is that has that been an in interest for you yeah. or people around you? Uh, actually, since this is a, a AI talk, then I avoided, and also considering the scope I could have, I avoided the data privacy part. But I am now uh, 
part of a group or the lead of a group on data privacy and protection in our department. Uh, because of my computer science and AI background, uh, I'm interested in carrying out health related research. But naturally, we also have work related to privacy of this health data. So ethics around this, privacy around this is something we are also focusing on, the GDPR. We have a lot of work uh, related to that. So that's uh, also a major concern. Uh, so we do work on it. And I'm pretty sure I have colleagues here who are in the team, uh, uh, part of this work that we mm -hmm. are doing. Yeah. And uh, for that reason, uh, for that purpose, we have... We are using, let's say, encryption techniques. And I have a student, Einstein. I asked him to join this talk. I don't know if he's here, but uh, as one of the master's students, we are working on encrypt the image data uh, or the video data so that the encrypted model can be feed into this deep network or other machine learning further to do the classification. But of course, then what does change? So if the data becomes encrypted, so does the models change? How do the models change and so on? That's also something we look into. And there are different ways of, of course, thinking around this. So encrypt the input data, encrypt the result, not the input data, uh, encrypt the data on the store, encrypt the data on the move, not necessarily machine learning. So there are different, um, different uh, ways of handling this. But of course, we collected, for example, for this third work, some data from the users, but we have anonymized it. So we did not announce who has responded to what, whose logs are what. So there is no such information. No personal information is provided. Uh, and we are working with open data sets. We have um, actually labeled a video capsule endoscopy data set uh, in cooperation with uh, University of Sheffield in UK. Uh, and data set, for example, we do not expose before we make sure uh, everything is around data privacy, everything falls within GDPR. We are very well aware of this and we are part of the team that works on data privacy. So that's a very good question to you. Thanks, thanks for a very yeah. comprehensive uh, yeah. answer. I think we're, we are approaching the top of the hour. Um, yeah. So, so Shula, thanks again for giving uh, giving this very interesting talk. Thanks to everyone in the audience for attending, and I wish you all a very nice weekend. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, and keep in touch. So, have a good rest of the day. Bye bye. <laughs>